if for a people who ruled and civilized an appreciable part of the world, those ancient Romans were a modest folk. In the matter of art, they were rather like the British in the matter of music. Like us, they had something of an inferiority complex. We are forever protesting that the British are not a musical nation. But all I can say is that if such be the case, we put up with a great deal of musical noise and turn out a, a remarkable lot of composers. And so the Romans. What did their great Virgil say about them? Others can be artists. Your job, my good Roman, is to govern an empire. And yet, those same good Romans managed to produce Virgil himself and a whole host of poets, philosophers, and historians whose works are still read today by millions. In the visual arts, they were the authors of the first romantic movement. They invented a brand new functional architecture on a scale which the Greeks before them had never thought of. Not that the Greeks and Romans were in competition in the matter, of course they weren't. Uh, any more than Chaucer was in competition with Pope. It isn't necessary to depreciate the glory that was Greece in order to uh, proclaim the grandeur that was Rome. And the converse is equally true. Rome 13 BC, the altar of peace set up by the Emperor Augustus. Let's join the crowd around it. No Greek abstractions these, but living men and women. Look at these creators of the Roman Empire, calm, conscious of their high destiny, successful, but free as yet from the vulgarities of success. The flesh and blood of Rome. The stern features shine out from the marble, vital, intelligent, proudly individual. The great Roman art of portraiture at its early best. names are mostly known to us. Agrippa, Emperor Regent, son-in-law of Augustus, garbed as a priest. Mycenas, prototype of wealthy patronage, and incongruously that child, none other than the father of Nero. Senators, wives, magistrates, priests, pass before us in grave tranquility, as sure of themselves as the artist of his own accomplishment. Man as an individual had arrived. Greek sculpture, at its best, had sought to glorify the godliness. Roman sculpture came to earth. It immortalized man himself, ordinary men and women in their infinite variety. In politics as in art, Imperial Rome was governed by talent and opportunity, by successful individuals. If you had talent, you could reach the top. How they peer at us, risen from the dead. It was the prowess of the individual that counted. Even an Arabian brigand, Philip the Arab, once became emperor of Rome. Flesh and blood. But when your Roman went abstract, this happened. Nero as Apollo, utter failure. The individual finally triumphed when a witless or witty emperor made his horse a consul. Individuality had taken the bit in its teeth. At its best, the truthfulness of this art can't be much improved. I don't know any starker piece of realism than this Greco-Roman boxer. Pitiless truth, flattened nose and cauliflower ear. At the same time, the Roman artist, having got his man, I tried to rescue him from the studio and set him in the landscape. Not always a very good landscape, but a revolutionary attempt. Here's an example on the Arch of Titus in Rome. The loot of captured Jerusalem sweeps past us in triumph. Procession and arch are shown in a crude perspective. It's the actual scene as it happened here in the Forum. It's real. It's new. It breathes, almost as the canvases of Velazquez breathed 15 centuries later.
Yes, in his modest way, the old Roman succeeded in bringing his people out into the open air. Aesthetically, he was on the threshold of a new world. On the threshold, but not further. Ultimately, the Romans failed to achieve the essential element of perspective. At Lepicus Magna in Libya, look at the local hero, Septimius Severus, a complete tangle. Emperor one way, horses another. Monumental confusion. At the same time, the sculptor was ever trying new devices to bring his marble to life. Deep shadows drilled and grooved in the stone to give dramatic light and shadow in the African sun. Near the dazzling sea at Lepkis, the most successful example of this art still sparkles. The adventures of Hercules and the god of wine, the background cut away and in shadow, is in vivid contrast with the hero of the story. See how the figures shine like marble lacework against the blackness. The sculptor is all the while conscious of environment. He often fails to express it, but at least he tries, and the attempt is new and significant. He's conscious of background. Yes, one of the great discoveries of Greco-Roman art was landscape. Look at this country scene from the wall of a Roman house on the Moselle. It might almost come from 19th century France. Here, gathered from the museums of Western Europe and Libya, is the pick of Roman landscape in painting and mosaic. Much of it has a romantic, artificial taste to it, even a touch of theatre. It isn't so much nature as a vision of nature seen through a window from a comfortable armchair with a sentimental book at hand. It's all rather like what we today call the romantic movement of the 18th and 19th century. Yes, the Romans contrived the first romantic movement in the history of art. Another Roman contribution was naive, but scarcely less enduring. It was a sort of petrified ancestor of our strip cartoon and newsreel. Continuous historical journalism. Here's a report of the Emperor Trajan's war in Hungary in AD 113, wrapped spirally around his column in Rome. The Emperor appears in scene after scene as hero, the Hungarians as gallant victims 18 centuries before their modern martyrdom. Real one. The Emperor Trajan leads his legions across the Danube. Real too, Trajan holds a council of war. Real three, prayer before battle. Real four, pep talk to the troops. Real five, battle is joined ferociously. A Roman soldier holds the head of his enemy between his teeth as he goes on fighting. 
Reel six, triumph. The heads of victims are trailed before the emperor. Last reel, the enemy village is raised to the ground. This device was new in art. The beholder is carried forward with a headlong speed of actuality. Epic sculpture, and as Roman as Virgil's Aeneid. Portraiture, scenery, narrative. Three debts we owe to the Roman sculptor and painter. Three achievements that express the mentality of a people which had its feet firmly on the ground was conscious of purpose and environment, but was not overburdened with ideas. In another sense, the Roman Empire was rather like a successful man who's made good from humble beginnings and in his latter years is preoccupied with his autobiography. Much of it is pedestrian stuff, but it has its moments, and at its best, it's very good indeed within its set limits. It is naively factual. Even when most dazzled by the glamour of empire, it allows the truth to filter through. Take this portrait of that sensual, weak-minded fiend, the Emperor Commodus. Contrast the weak, shrinking face with the lion skin of the virile Hercules. In that forthright imperialist Vespasian, the honest sculptor had a worthier subject. Regard his modern counterpart, Cecil Rhodes, of the Earth Earthy. Same empire builders, different empires. The Roman sculptor disguised nothing. But what of all this artistic output on the ultimate frontiers of the Roman world? Do we in Britain know much of our art to the Romans? They gave us our first civil service, gave us baths and drains. But when it comes to art, it's a sad story. We did our best, but we shuffled along pretty lamely. After all, this isn't the sunny Mediterranean. Up here in the north, we'd muffled ourselves up to the ears in an age-long battle with influenza. Not for us, the undisguised beauty of clean humanity. What thrived in the Mediterranean sun shivered up here. The result was hoods and mufflers. What meaning had the human form divine in those drear circumstances? Our own artists in the Celtic world certainly hammered out a glorious decorative art. Mirrors, brooches, shields were covered with gorgeous swaying patterns. But the human face and form were nowhere. Then suddenly, the Romans with their accomplished artistry. Marble portraits in a Roman country house in Kent. A river god, perhaps Father Thames himself, from some Mediterranean workshop. And we provincials struggle to conform. Here we are. Venus having a bath in Northumberland. What a Venus, what a bath. Or these Tyneside nymphs, very high class. Or these heads again from Northumberland, mercy on us. When the poor provincial sculptor left mankind behind, he was a little happier. Very rarely, the Romano-British artist achieved something. This pop-eyed fellow from Gloucester is perhaps the summit of our achievement. If it weren't for Picasso and our modern taste for abstraction, would we still get excited over this head? No, the remoter parts of the empire were buying civilization off the pig. In Africa, it's the same story. Look at these precious heads from Roman Libya. Far easier is it to acclaim the Romans as engineers and architects. The empire was, after all itself, a vast political engine flinging itself across nations 
like the great aqueducts which it hurled across countless landscapes to supply endless cities with extravagant baths. In the presence of such engineering as this towering bridge, the Pont du Gard, which carried water to Nîmes in Provence, would at the innermost core of the Roman mind. What plumbers they were, those Romans. Just look at it. But after all, they were much more than that. They were, first and foremost, great constructors. And uh, uh, as great functional constructors, their approach was often extraordinarily modern. <laughs> I remember years ago in London, uh, passing a big new government building, which was, uh, uh, to all intents and purposes, complete, if also uh, completely banal. But no, as I watched, along came a train of large lorries laden with columns and architraves. Architecture was on the way. Shortly, a fine neo-Edwardian uh, classical facade was stuck on the substantially complete building, which was now nine parts engineering and uh, one part art. Mix the taste. And what taste? Our Stonehenge, 1,500 years before the Romans, but not a bad place to see in principle where the Romans started from structurally and how far they eventually got. This is stone piled upon stone, static architecture in its extreme and simplest form. Parthenon of Athens shows this principle polished by civilization, vitalized by genius. Here is static architecture to perfection, perfect balance, perfect tranquility. The Roman added new and courageous flights of fantasy and science. He learned to fling vast vaults across wide spaces on an imperial scale. His domes challenged the skies. This mighty dome of the Pantheon in Rome is the ancestor of St. Peter's or St. Paul's in London. Built by the Emperor Hadrian, the Pantheon is the very symbol of Rome. Here the painter Raphael lies buried. In the history of architecture, this is a watershed. Man had discovered a new and grandiose way to put a roof over his head. That was merely a beginning. As time went on, the Roman engineer and architect became ever bolder and more original in his use of concrete. Towering over the Roman Forum stands the immense Basilica of Constantine, built in the last days of pre-Christian Rome. A fragment now, 
but once it was roofed with a concrete vault 70 feet in span and 120 feet above the ground. The grandeur of empire had at last found full-scale expression. Yet even more imposing are the bars of Caracalla and Diocletian. It's in character with the Roman genius that this triumphant use of concrete vaulting arose from purely secular enterprise, from public baths. Godless you might be, but at least as a Roman citizen you were expected to be cleanly, and you bathed in the grand style. Conjure up the fourth century. In the 16th century, Michelangelo transformed a wing of these same bars of Diocletian into a church. Rome's grandest triumph in the art of secular building was transmuted to serve the Christian tradition. In lesser ways too, the Roman architect was already building the future. Amidst the volcanic mud of Herculaneum, are columns carrying arches which already in the first century AD are the shape of things to come in medieval Europe. Today the Roman landscape bears these astonishing buildings with the air of a decayed nobleman. If only you could see what I once saw, it seems to say, look at this magnificence, and then points to a ragged ruin. The ruins are magnificent. The effort was prodigious. But what imagination it needs to conjure it all up. Immense shells of brick and concrete, here and there with surviving scraps of delicate plaster, stuck on like postage stamps on an envelope. Ornament and concrete never did take kindly to one another. They don't today. But this frail plaster work breathed a little life and grace into all that massive engineering. too came to the rescue. They've sometimes weathered the centuries better. In the baths of Lepkis Magna in Libya, they've been preserved to perfection. Hunting scenes and bloodshed sprawled with bold assurance across the vaults and domes of the Roman architect. It's all a little hard and uncompromising, yet it's all alive in a fierce and finite fashion. Here in Africa, amidst these quiet sands, Rome seems a long way off, and yet is all around me. In a way, it speaks more eloquently here than in the noisy streets of the capital. It proclaims our greatest extrovert civilization. So then in architecture, the Roman world stretching from Europe into Asia and Africa, contrived new devices and idioms which are still alive today. If I were quarrelling with the Greeks, which I'm not, uh, I might observe that for us today, their famous Parthenon is dead, insofar as a great work never die, uh, whilst the Roman pantheon is still living. Uh, I wouldn't dare to say that, but the idle thought had passed through my mind. And then there's the literature. How well the literature of the Romans fits in with what I've been trying to say about their art and architecture. This is not the time and place for me to sit and read to you from Virgil's grand epic of the origins of Rome or his uh, quiet Miltonic verses of the Italian countryside or the Roman historian's acid etching of the imperial court. But in the written word, as in painting and sculpture, we have on the one hand the elements of what I've called a romantic movement, 
and on the other, the biographical urge of a successful empire. We have, too, the beginnings of the novel, which is in a measure a mingling of the two streams. The modern novel, I suppose, goes back in a more or less direct line to that Roman African Apuleius, whose gay story, uh, The Golden Ass, uh, so delighted the Renaissance and was retold by La Fontaine. <laughs> the Apuleius, who in his travels uh, captured the affections of a rich widow at Tripoli and uh, was prosecuted for witchcraft by her exasperated relations, probably here in this very building in the Sobrata Sun. Or there's that other Roman storyteller, Petronius, uh, whose satirical account of a Roman dinner party uh, is still such good, robust reading and puts him into the company of Rabelais and Fielding and Smollett and even Anatole France. All these things help to bring the Roman world alive. Yes, they could be astonishingly like us, those old Romans. So like us sometimes as to be almost uh, unlikable. At every turning in the Forum or in Tacitus, we can, without prodigious effort, see ourselves amongst our own ruins and our own errors. Now and then, too, we may see our own triumphs, although with foreknowledge of their brevity. The Roman poet Virgil exercised a poet's privilege and looked into the future. When you have learned, he said, to read the praises of the great and come to understand what manhood is, the waving corn will slowly flood the plains with gold. Grapes hang in ruby clusters on the thorn. Yet even so, traces of our wickedness will linger on to make us venture on the sea in ships and build walls round our cities. Wars will repeat themselves and the great Achilles be dispatched to try once more. The fates have spoken the unalterable decree of destiny. This is the pattern of the age to come. There spoke the Roman poet, who above all others sang of the grandeur that was Rome. But he was not dazzled by the brightness of its glory. He retains a cosmic, uh, a prophetic sense. For him, as for our own Shelley, faiths and empires gleam like wrecks of a dissolving dream. That dream does not end with Rome.